Okay, I think everybody is in. So good morning, everyone. Um, we are doing a bit of a hybrid here, but um, we're this is the January 11th um, bicycle pedestrian subcommittee meeting. We are recording and this will be available for viewing if anybody wants it um, at Northampton Open Media um, after today. Um, so we've got a couple of items, a sh fairly short agenda, but a couple of items first up. Um, let me just pull this again. I don't have it in front of me. Let's see. Um, so uh, public comment will take first. Um, so if anybody has a public comment they would like to make, um, you can raise your hand either virtually on the screen or um, not. Okay, I see Jeff Slavin. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, Jess Slavin. Um, I live over on Red Ave. I used to come to these meetings pretty regularly, but the 9 a.m. Wednesday has been pretty tough for me um, to be able to come and join you all. So glad to be able to come today. Um, I just wanted to make a, a small comment on the recent um, Pleasant Street project with the roadway narrowing. I'm super appreciative of the protected um, separated bike lanes that were put in. I'm seeing people use them all the time. They're really awesome. Um, I, I still have some major concerns about the fact that the um, pedestrian island wasn't removed during that project because the way that the separated bike lane suddenly ends for paint right now, the cars swerve into the bike lane because they're worried about hitting the pedestrian island. And I've seen a couple of close calls now, um, especially with folks who are taking that left hand turn out of Hockham Road and kind of they go right into the painted lane. Um, so I just wanted to make a, a small comment there that um, uh, I hope that in future projects, we can ensure that our separated lanes are as um, connected and seamless as possible. And then also, um, we haven't had too much snow this season, uh, but the, the few times it has snowed and there's been some considerable snow, um, the bike lane hasn't been plowed at all. Um, and it's been pretty slick and I've noticed like people are still riding on the bike lane like there's tire tracks through the snow, um, but the sidewalk is cleared and the road is cleared but the bike lane isn't cleared which has definitely um, I've seen some people kind of fish chilling on their bikes a little bit trying to use the lane when there's snow there so. Um, yeah just wanted to come make make comments about that and uh, thank you so much for your time and I appreciate being able to join in here virtually, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Barbara Bricker. Hi, I'm Barbara Bricker. I live on Meadow Street. This is my first meeting to go to. And also it was my first time to go to the meeting that you report to transportation and whatever it's called. And on that meeting, we Meadow Street was on the agenda. And Meadow Street has only Sharrows. And one of the things that happened outside of that meeting is we inquired, I may be starting way at the beginning because I don't know anything. I'm just in the learning curve that there is really no education about what a Shero is and what a Shero means and how a Shero works except at driver's education. And I can dig around and find that reply, but I think you guys know, must know that already. And for Meadow Street, it's especially tough because we are the access point to the Florence Fields where kids go down. So that's one thing. We are pursuing um, a number of things on Meadow Street since the repaving. We expect a response and we expect to continue. Uh, we're meeting the 24th at Lilly Library. We are so delighted that the chief of police will be coming as a speaker to that meeting. And um, so happy to be here and so happy that somebody is thinking about bike safety and street safety. And we're on board Meadow Street. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Any other public comments? Okay, great. Thanks, we'll move on. 
Um, the next item is just I wanted to bring back the um, bike shelter, covered bike shelter. We received a grant for uh, $10,000 um, to install a bike shelter downtown. And um, they're much more expensive than I guess previously um, assumed there in and what um, the amount for which we applied um, in the grant. And um, I know there had been a conversation in previous meetings about the potential for doing fundraising if there's a gap between what we found as a potential um, bid price and um, the grant allotment. So I just wanted to share with you what we think is probably gonna be the most cost-effective way to get a shelter with the funds that we have. And it's a, um, it's a Darrow shelter. So if you guys remember, there was a, we have a, we have one um, a Darrow parklet um, and it's sort of one, it's a modular unit. And so I think I'll, what I'll do is just screen share um, that, let me just pull it up, um, uh, system so that we can run through it um, and give you the, I'll show you the pricing. Um, so can everybody see this um, bike shelter here? This is like the the um, the example of the most. This is the stacked system, but that but we have quotes for um, one that would hold eight loops in the bottom. But I'll just show you the sort of the rest of the layout. This is their standard module, and you can add on to it. So I'm just going to scroll through. There are different configurations. Um, but the basic configuration is in this lower left corner here with it stores um, eight bikes on loops. This one is showing um, vertical hanging, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and so here's the layout. It's a 12 foot um, wide shelter. And um, as you can see over here that it's um, actually the bottom eight racks on um, hoop racks will contain eight bikes, they're saying. So this system is just a one module is um, 70, about $7,500. If we add um, a second module, so double it, um, you can see how you can keep adding on here in this lower um, graphic um, to, I think it becomes a 14, I'm sorry, let me look at the quote here. If we, essentially double it. It's um, a 24 foot um, length and um, it's a $4,500 increase. So the total with installation and shipping is going to be about $16,000. You see at the bottom of the quote, um, I don't, let's, let's go to this bottom one here. Sorry, it's not showing up. Um, but it was about $16,000 for a 20 for two of these. So, and I think we have space for a 20, you know, 24 foot span. I talked to, um, and that would include installation because we've had a conversation with Donna and I think Donna's on now, but um, we don't know that we have capacity to do in-house installation. So I think it's probably just best to assume that we'll, in, um, pay for the installation, but that still means that we have about a $6,000 gap um, between what the funds that we received would cover and the cost, the quote that we've been given for this system. So I just wanted to share that and, and get your feedback on your thoughts on that. And then I will stop my screen share so we can go back to, um, I can figure out how to do this. Um, sorry. Uh, it's in the, it's all the way in the top. Oh, uh, maybe it's behind here. It's weird the way it's hidden. Yeah. <laughs> God. All right, just bear with me. If someone has a comment, I can take that now while I'm trying to figure out how to screen share or d drop my screen share. I see it down here.
Oh, don't want that. Is it at the top? Do you see it? All right. Can you move the connected to Pet Planning TV away? Is it up there behind that? I don't think it is. That's so weird. Okay. So, um, Carolyn, where, where is this to be located? Well, so there are two spaces we've been thinking about. Um, one might be at the back of Blasky Park yep. where there's already a concrete pad. So that's the other thing. We need yep. a level space where there's concrete. And um, then we had initially looked at an area in front where the art kiosk is now, but apparently that's pre already been programmed by the Arts Council. Okay. Um, so I think that's off the table. Um, so I guess that sort of points back towards somewhere in the Pulaski Park vicinity. We haven't looked at any, I know there was an idea raised that maybe we look at behind Starbucks in that park, public parking lot and taking up parking spaces, but that um, one is not so visible um, and maybe not as accessible, but also would require an ordinance change to remove those parking spaces or convert those parking spaces to bike parking. Certainly it would seem that, that having it in on that side of Main Street though would be a big advantage just in terms of the way things curl around and and proximity, um, but that would just be my my two cents. But it doesn't solve the fundraising question, right? So I guess that would be the question: Is does any um, I do people think that this makes sense to do fundraising, or should we just drop back to a single? um system you know a single shelter that shelters eight i mean that's a possibility too because that's seventy five hundred dollars um versus the fifteen or sixteen hundred dollars i think you should fundraise i think fundraising is can be done in lots and lots of ways you know can do it on facebook and how many bike riders do we have and how much money per bike rider if we paid a dollar per bike rider would that be enough i just think you mean i mean it's a job to figure out how to fundraise there's no question about that but to put in the facility and have it too small it's too small right makes no sense to me whatsoever and i'm not even you know i'm only at all out of venture on a tricumbent bike that's my common sense just shooting that in. Thank you. I, I agree with Barbara um, that this is Nick Horton um, that um, I think that if we can try to see about fundraising, it's proven very effective for the office in the past in terms of leveraging other uh, sources of funding. And uh, um, I think putting together a kind of a fundraising letter from the bike ped committee with the kind of a sense of, of this project would make a lot of sense. Um, Jess? Hey, yeah. Um, so my two cents in terms of placement is as close as to the bus stop as we can get would be um, my prerogative to aid multimodal connections. And I know that the Pulaski Park bike racks are already completely full, um, especially with students who are picking up the bus to go to UMass Amherst. And I think this would be um, filling a very important gap um, that currently exists at the park in that area of downtown. Um, and I also agree that we should try to, um, get the full size that we're looking for, because I don't think eight spots is really going to, um, make a dent in the need of parking downtown for bikes right now, especially covered parking. Um, uh, my question with the rack, the way I'm looking at it right now is, um, we had on the call, someone note that she does ride a trike. Um, will trikes be able to be parked in this type of facility? Because it, 
the schematic I'm looking at right now looks like the bikes are stacked. So I just want to make sure that there's room for cargo bikes um, and trikes and any type of bicycle that might be um, slightly larger um, that people will be riding in downtown. Thank you. Um, I think just to answer that question, we I don't think we would go for a stacked system. I think that creates, um, you know, accessibility issues all around. Even if you have a normal size bike, I think, you know, we don't have any system like that now. Um, so I think it would just be a pull in, which is why it the, the single module holds eight with just sort of the um, where you can essentially um, uh, cost effective and also simplest way to create covered storage. So um, to the extent that um, we want to create create a space for larger vehicles, I think it's just a matter of accommodate that is what I would um, assume. So um, Karen Foster. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just Jess actually uh, made the comment that I would have made, but thinking about um, bike storage, uh, I think bigger will accommodate more people, particularly as she mentioned, cargo bikes, bikes with trailers, um, trikes in order to really be accessible to all users. Um, and then also just to reiterate, I think the closer to the bus stop, the better thinking about covered bike storage. I would imagine that's for a lot of folks that are going to be leaving it while taking the bus elsewhere um so that that makes sense and if there's anything i can do to support i i understand the the funding gap that's not easy um but just wanted to offer my support for that great thank you ben uh hi again i feel like i'm talking to you every hour of every day now um <laughs> good morning <laughs> good morning um so i i i agree with everyone that fundraising at this level shouldn't be too challenging and we have a lot of enthusiastic uh pro biking people out there who should be able to do that i would like to possibly get you to reconsider since we're talking about the larger storage uh area and we're going to have that storage area actually have less per person capacity because we're going to expect cargo bikes and trikes and so forth to maybe consider doing half as a double decker because that creates more room for the other users um you know the, the it, for less money right so you you get you get more storage for less money which allows you to uh, um, assign more of that storage to trikes and cargo bikes so would you so just um wanted to clarify so i scrolled up a little bit and it shows this uh darrow decker 14 bikes um or um i guess they're calling this a duplex i'm not sure <laughs> yeah. what the difference would be but you're i don't know either something like that um or, Some... or this i'm not quite sure either about these hanging bikes that show 12 um, I think it's probably just a matter of additional equipment that is assigned to or, or um, distributed with the acquisition. So I could certainly have them price out sort of one module that is a double decker and the other is just sort of with no additional um, framing for storage underneath. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, or or hoop racks or whatever it is. The truth is, I don't ride a... Uh... A trike or a utility bike so i don't know what the the limitations are in terms of the best way to attach them um so i would ask uh, may, maybe maybe jess knows the answer to that one um but um it, for the normal bike right for the typical bike either one of those is fine i i the the 12 bike um, my guess is just kind of looking at the equipment it's probably cheaper um and i'd go with that um, although for people whose upper body strength isn't sufficient to lift their bike and put it on a rack, again, not knowing the exact how this thing is actually uh, arranged, I do know that most of the double deckers that I've loaded onto have kind of a little drop thing that you can kind of 
roll the front of your bike onto and then it's got a lever so you can push it up yeah so it makes it easier for people with less upper body strength to to put their bike into place right i think the other i think that probably makes sense the other piece of it is you know even if you have a light bike and but if you're commuting you might have you know storage um, components that make it much heavier and and more cumbersome to sort of load up on a hook like that. So, um, okay. So I guess um, I don't know if anybody else has comments on this, but what I could do is get a price for the Darrow Decker and see what that total is, and then send it around to the committee, um, and then we know what that fundraising gap would be uh, for that. What's your timing? Well, we have till I think it's December to spend the money. So we should really get this done through the spring so we can put an order in yep. and okay. um, get it done. Thank so, you. yeah. Um, okay. I still haven't figured out how to close my screen, <laughs> um, my screen share, because the, the controls must be hidden somewhere. So, um, let me just see. Maybe if I, what happens if I close that window? See if that works. Try just hitting escape. Okay. On your keyboard. It's different from any Zoom sharing I've ever seen. Hmm. Um, I think because of the, the TV connection, but. Um, oh, there we go. There we go. Great. Yeah. I turned off the whole, okay. So now. Is everybody has just people they're seeing? Okay. Um, so next up, um, I had on the agenda updates from uh, about uh, traffic calming and up on other updates from DPW. So is um, Donna online? Yep. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Thanks for coming. Sure, thanks. So I just want to give everyone a um, kind of a preview of the next TPC meeting, which is scheduled for Tuesday. Um, and uh, just a brief update on the high school traffic study, which uh, I know we've all been um, kind of eagerly waiting for. So uh, some months ago, we engaged Fuss and O'Neill, our traffic engineering firm, to do a fairly comprehensive uh, study of of the entire network of roads around the high school um, with an eye towards improving um, just across the board safety, pedestrian, bicyclists, uh, motorists, um, and also looking at uh, traffic flow within the high school campus itself. So within the existing uh, uh, bus loop um, and, and within the parking lot. Um, so it's a fairly comprehensive study and, and it's been ongoing for uh, about 12 months. Um, and, and we have a final report back from Fuss and O'Neill um, that I intend to discuss uh, in, in much more detail uh, at the TPC meeting Tuesday and then move several uh, actions forward. But what I wanted to do this morning is just talk a little bit uh, or sort of preview a, a little bit about what the uh, results of the traffic study are. Um, and, and then just kind of talk about how we move forward from that. So um, the what we asked Fuss and O'Neill to do again was a, a very comprehensive um, look at the entire network of roads around the high school. So the Route 9 corridor, um, the Elm Street turn that ultimately turns into uh, Manitoc Street, um, and, and then the uh, Milton Street kind of Riverside, you know, strange intersection, and again, traffic flow in, in, the, um, in the existing bus loop and parking lot for the high school. And we asked them to look at a variety of scenarios, which included um, potentially making Woodlawn Ave uh, a, a dead end road. We asked them to look at uh, the potential for roundabouts on, on Route 9. We asked them to look at closing off the turn to Elm Street from Route 9. That's obviously a huge source of conflict. Um, so we, we gave them sort of a list of things to examine uh, as part of their work. 
and uh, they have come back with a series of recommendations which I I will uh, briefly run through and again I'll speak about all of this in more detail Tuesday at TPC so I certainly encourage uh, attendance at that meeting from from in stakeholders um, but the uh, primary um, recommendation from Clotinomial are signalized intersections uh, on the Route 9 corridor at both the intersection with Woodlawn and the intersection where Elm Street goes off of Route 9. Um, the reason for the signalized intersections is that geometrically a roundabout will not fit. Um, so they explored a variety of different options to control traffic and we are constrained by parklands in our child's park is is protected under um, the Massachusetts Constitution. Um, so, you know, trying to uh, take parkland for any sort of roadway project um, actually requires an act of the legislature. It's, it's just a total no go. Um, so, from a geometric right of way standpoint, we have um, you know, right of way constraints. Um, that, that sort of limit our options within that corridor due to parkland on both sides of the Route 9 corridor. So that triangle of land in front of the high school um, is actually considered parkland uh, under the Massachusetts Constitution, um, as well as on the child park side. So um, again, we're looking at signalized intersection at Woodlawn, we're looking at a signalized intersection at Route 9 and the turn to Elm Street. Um, we are uh, looking at uh, reopening of the historic uh, uh, a driveway, I guess I would call it, or passageway in front of the high school um, that was closed in the 90s. That would be reopened to buses, which would relieve the uh, congestion in the parking lot. Um, and, and in sort of that existing bus loop um, where the handicapped parking is in front of the high school. Um, so the idea is to sort of pull the buses out of there, put them in a defined bus loop that would not be open to traffic. Um, and uh, at that point, you would sort of free up capacity for traffic flow within the parking lot. And then we could sort of deal with that circulation without buses complicating the issue. Um, and, you know, there's there's several other uh, recommendations, including the restriction of parking on Route 9, uh, where we have already restricted parking, um, and, as well as uh, some sort of geometric uh, alterations to the Milton and Riverside intersection and uh, the potential for runway traffic flow on, on Milton. Um, it, so uh, with all of that said, you know, in terms of kind of uh, managing expectations here for folks, you know, this traffic study is taking about 12 months, um, you know, construction timelines are long, um, you know, design for roadway improvements, it can be at least a 12 month uh, stretch and then construction often uh, stretches over, you know, a couple of construction seasons. Um, so, so sort of in the interest of uh, moving forward, because obviously we, we want to have a bias to action here. Um, the intent is what we're going to post the TPC agenda for Tuesday and on that agenda um, will be uh, kind of more detailed remarks from me about the study. Um, and, and the things that I just talked about as well as a few more details, um, as well as asking TPC to um, push through uh, a parking ordinance, a parking restriction ordinance for Route 9, um, as well as the imposition of school zones, which are now legal for uh, high schools. Um, so we want to establish a school zone at the high school. We also want to establish a, a school zone uh, for Smith Grove. So, um, and, and that has to be uh, added benefit of, of actually dropping us uh, in, in that entire corridor, um, plus approved by city council. So that's kind of just a, a executive summary of um, what we're looking at doing um, at TPC. I'll also add that the complete streets ordinance does require discussion and a vote by TPC um, to allow uh, the installation of a signal versus a roundabout. Um, so I will be 
um, that, that will be on the agenda and I will be asking for that vote uh, Tuesday uh, again in the interest of time and pushing this project forward. Um, and as, as I mentioned, we are very geometrically constrained. We have parkland on both sides of us. Um, we do not have a lot of space to work with in this corridor and this is the uh, preferred alternative um, for how to move forward. You know, best case scenario, we would be looking at some sort of construction of improvements, uh, not this summer, but summer of 2024. And that's provided we could get everything done we need to get done and we can get parts, um, you know, to actually put off a traffic signal, you know, we can actually get a contract to mobilize. And, and it's not clear to me at this time if we'll be able to, but you know, the, uh, the, the days are coming off the calendar here. So, so we want to try to move as quickly as we can. So, um, that is it, an update on that corridor. I know a lot of folks are interested in that, and um, I, I welcome uh, a robust attendance uh, Tuesday um, to have a more uh, in-depth discussion about this. Thanks, Donna. Um, and just to sort of follow up, I know the bike ped committee had a discussion at the last meeting about sending a recommendation to TPC that may, um, to explore alternatives, temporary alternatives that could potentially be instituted but you know in the interim before you know during the design phase and before construction could begin on a sort of a long-term solution um and so that message did carry forward to tpc i think um the other piece of it um that donna may talk about at tpc is that um fuss and o'neill did um provide some um, suggestions about those temporary measures that could take place before full construction. So let's say best case scenario is the summer of 2024. I mean, that's probably really, really best case <laughs> and maybe not so realistic. We don't know, but they suggested things like uh, almost like painting um, bump outs in the street. Now that, I mean, that's very temporary and it's also dependent upon sort of you know, weather conditions and all of that. So there are some things that the consultant also recommended that um, um, potentially could be discussed further. Yep, thanks, Carolyn. And, and you know, we'll we'll try to have a good discussion at TPC Tuesday. I, I mean, we have, you know, a two hour meeting and I'm gonna have um, two ordinances on the agenda plus the vote for the signalized intersection, you know, based on sort of the data that we'll provide and, and the overlay, you know, Fuss and O'Neill actually did an overlay of a roundabout onto Route 9 and it's sort of taking into parkland and you'd be looking at eminent domain takings. I, I mean, so they've done a, a fairly robust analysis for us um, and, and understanding what our options are. I, you know, at this point, I, I, I think we do need to have a bias to action. Um, and, and so that's why we're going to ask for a vote on Tuesday. Um, but with all that said, I, I imagine there's quite a bit of um, community interest in this, and I want to make sure that you know we hear everyone who who wishes to speak, and, and we'll try to um, manage that meeting. Um, you know, I've cleared the agenda of everything except uh, items related to the high school um, in the event that we do have. A, a significant turnout, so I'm not really sure what to expect. Um, but I have been in touch with the president of the PTO and, and briefed her on the situation. And, and there's obviously, um, it, you know, a lot of stakeholders involved here. So um, I, I hope that folks will be present for that meeting and, and we'll put something together and kind of walk everybody through uh, what Boston O'Neill has been up with. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. Um, Donna, thank you very much. It's it's obviously a, a, a tricky um, kind of set of intersections and a really important problem. And I understand why it's taken uh, the time to kind of get that uh, report put together. Will that Fuss and O'Neill report be included as part of the background materials uh, for the uh, TPC meeting, or is that available in some other fashion? It, yeah, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that report on my website, um, on the or on the DPW's website rather. I'm I'm not going to link it to the agenda. It's over 200 pages long, and it's it's a little much to link to an agenda. So, um, I think you know we can just sort of uh, direct folks to our website, and um, and I'll put a link on there. 
Um, I, I just have to work through those logistics, but good question, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments about this item? Can I just add one other thing? So I realize that acts of legislature are kind of make it in the almost completely non-starter category, but I know that that the park has serious infrastructure issues with drainage in that corner of the park. Are they interested in all in in any kind of you know conversations about doing something that again I think of legislative action as extraordinary, but. Um, you know, again, I know that their drainage issues there are antiquated to say the least. And I'm just wondering if that, if they might see this as a potential win-win. Um, um, Cause that signalized intersection I'm imagining is gonna feel a lot like the Hospital Hill one in terms of the two intersections separated out. Is that, oh, yeah, it's gonna be like that, right? It's gonna have multiple components to it. Um, and again, it, it still doesn't address the issue down at that wonky um, Milton Street or Milton Street or... and um, and Bay State Village. But um, I don't know how when you said wonky that I knew that you were talking about Milton Street, but <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there was a question there, Donna. I'm just I'm just wondering. Um, I think uh, yeah, I I hear your. I hear your point and and um, I, I think what we'll do is, you know, where this isn't necessarily a posted agenda item for discussion this morning, sort of in the interest of open meeting law, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll address your question Tuesday. Um, it, it just is part of my remarks um, and your, your point is taken, so I appreciate it. Great. Okay. If no other comments or questions on this, um, I think the only other thing I had on the agenda was for minutes um, from December. Can I move we approve the minutes from December? Sure. <laughs> Is there a second? I second it. Thanks, Michael. Um, OK, so we're hybrid, so I'm going to do a roll call. Um, uh, ben? I, I'm not actually on this committee. Oh, you, yeah, but you're first on my list. Sorry. <laughs> and I've seen you so many times in the last two days, I can't keep it straight. Sorry about that. <laughs> and Donna isn't either. Okay, I'm going to go with Nick. I know he's on the committee. <laughs> vote yes. Michael. Uh, Maggie? I'll abstain. I was not present. Okay, so here we're gonna have a problem and I'll just have to say, accepting the minutes doesn't mean that you were there. You can also accept them without being there, but I will also, I will vote yes. Um, so I think that's three of four, which squeaks us by. <laughs> um, okay, thank you all. I appreciate um, your time. And um, let me know if you have any items that you um, that come up in the meantime between now and February, and we can get those on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you.